Thanks. Thanks, Olivier. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's it's good to see everyone, only I can just see the backs of about a few heads. Um, but I guess there are a number of people who are listening in. Um, I do wish I was there in person in Lumini. It's one conference where you actually want to be present uh, for. And it's been a weird, it's been a weird time. I haven't seen many of you for a long time. And uh, so these are strange times, but I hope you all are well and, and safe. This is a random forest is a new uh, topic for me. And this is actually the, the, my, my debut talk on, on, on random forest. So I do have some opening night jitters, which uh, because I haven't been able to work out the kinks yet. So we'll see, we'll see how it goes. So this is joint work with, um, with Mikhail uh, Nielsen. Mikhail uh, defended his, his PhD dissertation last uh, December from Aarhus and has been working with me as a postdoc. He arrived in, ja in January in New York and this is not like the optimal time to arrive in New York. It's just a couple months before the pandemic um, hit. But um, I need to give a, a shout out to Mikhail because he did all the uh, heavy lifting in this work and there's a lot of heavy lifting to be done. So let me uh, let me begin. Uh, see if I can advance the slide uh, with a shout out to uh, Leo Bryman and I and this audience I think is mostly from kind of the stochastic process probability side and you probably know his work in probability quite well. And so random forest is an idea uh, introduced by uh, Bryman. It was in inspired by um, CART, which is the Bryman et al. Uh, work. Um, this this paper that on where he introduced random forest in 2001, this has like 63,000 citations and the CART work has 47,000 citations. So this is um, this is really resonated in the in the community. And um, he's like one of the, he was one of the leading uh, data science scientists. And, um, you know, they, they, they swear by this guy. But in terms of breadth, this guy is just, should be in the pantheon of um, a famous statistician. So some of you may only be aware of the work in probability, but the stuff in, um, in statistics um, has, has been incredible. So um, he was influenced by Loeb and, uh, and Blackwell while he was doing a PhD at Berkeley. He had a textbook on probability, which I actually used in graduate school, uh, developed CARP. But if you were gonna look at, I suggest you have another look at Bryman. There's this conversation with Bryman. It's in statistical science. And it's a really a fascinating look at the man. It's in many respects, I think of him as like the Richard Feynman of, um, of physics or of, of statistics. And then this paper that he wrote, uh, statistical modeling, two, the two cultures, people are still talking about this paper. It's like generative models versus predictive models where he's taken aside that statistics needs to be think about predictive models where are modeling where there really aren't any models. So um, you might you might have a look at that. Okay. So the so let me start with a sort of a classical um, setting of random forest um, where we think about a, a really the uh, a regression model. So here we have uh, x t y t. So the x t's are the um, are the inputs and y t's the output. So we're thinking about this as being i d and it follows this model y equals f of x plus uh, plus some noise. And the goal is to estimate this conditional expectation of y given x is equal to little x. And here. Uh, X could be high dimensional, and um, you're thinking about F as really being nonlinear. And the, the idea behind random forest is you use regression trees or uh, recursive partitioning, so to kind of slice up the feature space. Um, feature space is kind of is a fancy term for independent variables, XT. And you, you kind of slice and dice the um, so if you're if p if the dimension is is two, uh, the dimension of x is equal to two. You, you'd slice and dice the you know uh, r two into into uh, uh, smaller rectangles, and then once you finish this partition and the partition is done in a recursive fashion, then when you take a little x and you find a, the box in the last partition that's in some set. And then to estimate f, you just take the average of the y's over all, where the x's fall in that, in that set. 
So that's the that's the idea behind um, uh, uh, random forest. So the advantages of um, random forest, if you've never come across them, is that it's a learning algorithm that sort of aggregates estimates of a large number of trees. So you 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 can generate one uh, partition. It's a random partition. It's done recursively. That's called a tree. And then you can do it a second time and a third time. You get different trees each time. They may, there may be some strong dependence between them, but you, you get different trees, and then you average these um, the estimates over um, multiple trees. It's used in in a, in a variety of applications: with object recognition, bioinformatics, ecology, and finance. And I'm just not throwing words out there um, that maybe it's used. It's it, they really are used in, in these things. And one of, the, one of the big advantages is that there's not much tuning uh, required in this work. And many people view um, these random forests or the kind of the <clears throat> state of the art general purpose prediction algorithms. So they work well, but unfortunately there's not so much theory, um, nice theory tied with this. So we um, gonna take a crack at that in this paper and apply to the, uh, to the time series setting. So here's the, here's the setup. We have a time series YT. It's going to be a nonlinear uh, AR model. Uh, so we, we're just trying to think of the simplest um, uh, kind of general setting that we could consider for a time series. And we think about YT, YT here. I don't know if you see both the, the dot in my hand. You see both. Huh? YT is equal to a function of the previous P observations plus epsilon T t greater than or equal to one. And of course, what t is equal to one was going to need some initial values, y zero, y one minus p. And we'll assume that we'll have a, uh, we'll have conditions that we have a stationary solution. So it's going to be driven with um, stationary uh, initial values. And this, this p here, uh, it could be large and it could be increasing with the sample size. I'm going to just speak about the case where a, a p is fixed, um, but you could carry out everything I, uh, I'm going to talk about with P increasing as well. It's just hard to keep track of the um, of the constant of the constants as you go along. Um, it's hard to see the the trees through the forest. That's my only random forest joke. So based on the observations, um, x1, y1 up to xt, yt, t is going to be the sample size. Uh, we're, going to, we're going to estimate this conditional expectation y uh, given x is equal to x. So this epsilon t is going to be independent of, of the y's. It's uh, going to kind of like I have a causal um, representation. <clears throat> so what about these uh, partitions? So let me let me walk you through how these partitions are constructed. We so we're in our uh, p p dimensional space. The first partition. P1 will be just equal to the whole space. And then we'll construct Pn plus one from Pn as follows. So let's let's just construct P2 from P1. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll select an unsplit node. So it, if we're n is equal to one, so that's just Rp. And then we'll, we'll figure out, we'll, we'll choose a split direction. So there'll be, the directions are their p directions on corresponding to the p axes, the p dimensions, and you you often select these at random. So there's some probabilities that are associated with that. They may each be equally likely, um, but there's some pi. So it, it it chooses a a direction. So if p is equal to two, for example, um, we might choose the x direction, or probably half, or the y direction, or probably half. Once we choose that direction, then we have to decide how we're going to split it. And we're going to split it into two sets. So we're going to split either, um, we're going to uh, construct a tall, this is like a threshold. And, and AL is going to be all um, X, all points in that threshold, all, and if, we're, if N is equal to one, it's going to be all pairs where the, if i is equal to one, where the first component, the x component is lesser than equal to tall, and then ar is gonna be where the um, first component is greater than tall. So it's just kind of thresholding on that, on that axis. So you can think of a, a is the, the parent node of al and ar. It's a very simple um, binary kind of construction. And the al and ar are referred to as the, uh, the child nodes of a. 
So it, a given partition of RP is called recursive. It's if you can obtain it in this um, recursive manner, so just as I, did, I described P1 through Pn as above. So uh, let me say a few things about choosing the node, the direction and position of the split. The, um, so we, we're having, we have model uh, observations from this model. And so the XTs we're thinking about, um, these are like the, the feature space, but it's a little different than a regression problem because these um, XTs, the, the things that you're, the, <clears throat> these independent variables are really dependent with the observation. So previous lags are in this XT, which is, doesn't happen in a kind of reg uh, regression, standard regression setting. So we want to think about this as kind of an input-output pair, just to mimic what you do in, in this sort of regression setting. The, the DT is going to be the information set. So it's the, um, and I'll, I'll write it this way, it's going to be, uh, you're going to have these pairs, X1, Y1 up to XT, YT. And so we want to carve up this XT space, this uh, p-dimensional space. So we're going to, first, uh, the, the split direction is just going to be, um, you're going to specify some probabilities. Um, they could depend on DT if you wish. In a time series setting, for example, um, you may want to go in the first direction more often than the other directions because you think that um, you may think that the previous observation has more um, descriptive power than 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 the others. So these don't all have to be the same one over uh, one over p. And they could depend on, on, on the data as well. The, tr the trickier uh, part is to choose this threshold, this tau. Um, so it, once you choose this i direction, then you, you want to split these xi's. And you want to split them in a way that gives you most information about f. And what Brian suggests was maximizing the impurity. And I want to think about this because many of you are time series people and you work on change point problems. This looks like a change point problem, where what you do is um, you think about observing uh, yi's a time series, but the y's are observed at xi. And what you want to find is a, um, the best change point for these yi's. Uh, when they're observed at Xi. So you want to choose tall such that when you look at the sample variance for Xi is less than tall, plus the sample variance for the Xi is greater than tall, that this is a minimum. This is exactly what we do um, in, in change point problems for detecting like a change in the mean or something like that. So this, um, I haven't uh, seen anyone really kind of make that that analogy, but I, I think it might be interesting for us to think about that a little bit. It's really a change point problem uh, in a random field. A random field because you think about observations at the XIs, not at fixed time uh, time points. And in fact, it may be closer to what um, uh, threshold models. It might be more like a threshold uh, style model. So this this choice of tall where you do the splitting it may depend on DT as it does here in, in Bryman and it could depend on other uh, other random mechanism that's uh, independent of the DT so you may be flipping a coin or doing something else uh, a common way is just take the median of the um, just split on the medians of the XI just split fifty percent each time. I have no idea if I'm going too fast or, or too slow, but maybe I'll just push on. Um, so, so the regression tree estimate, the idea here then is you, you, want, you want to look at an X and then you have this partition, you have this recursive tree partition called lambda. And at the end, you'll find X is going to be in one of these um, A lambdas. And what, so, you just look at um, the XTs which fall in that rectangle that contains X. You count the number of XTs that fall in that rectangle, and then you just average the Ys over that rectangle. That's pretty straightforward, uh, kind of an obvious thing to do. And that, this is the object of, um, of study here. So it's, it's good to introduce uh, something called the partition optimal tree. And 
um, that's given as follows. So we'll, we'll think about y and x as being an um, as a copy of the of the joint distribution of x one y one, um, independent of the data at hand dt and this random mechanism here. And so this conditional expectation, it's just it's um, so when you have the real data and you have x, then you can form the set. So this is the conditional this the conditional expectation of y, it's the average value of y given x is in that set. <clears throat> so you can calculate this y given x is in some set where it doesn't depend on the other data. But so this is just a plug-in type guy. You take y given x is in some set and you replace that set with this random set determined by this recursive uh, partition. So this is kind of what we do when we think about uh, Kobeck library information. When we look at information criteria like AIC or whatever. You take like an independent realization and then you calculate that likelihood, the expected value of that likelihood relative to an independent realization given the parameter values have been estimated by the observations that you have. So just to be clear here that this E sub lambda, this denotes, denotes uh, the expectation with respect to this conditional probability of P of a given DT and given theta. Um, so this set really is treated as non-random uh, in this equation. Um, so, so it's kind of like a plug-in. So what we're gonna look at actually is the difference between this estimate and this kind of partition optimal tree. This is if you knew this conditional expectation, um, this is what, <clears throat> what, you should, what you get. And, and if we go, go forward here, if these sets are getting small and are converging to X, so we'll need to control the size of these, these are called leaves in, in the tree. As, we, as those leaves get smaller, then this should converge to um, F of X. That's the conditional expectation of Y given X is equal to X. And so if this guy here is close to this and this is converging to F of Y given X, I mean, F, F of X, what we wanna estimate, then this guy should be consistent. For estimating f of x, so that's the um, that's the idea. So we'll first look at the difference between this um, and this guy, and we'll show that in some sense that the difference goes to zero. It's going to go uniformly in some sense. It's going to go uniformly in x and over all uh, partitions that you uh, nice partitions of R p. Okay, so now I'm gonna get um, into the weeds a bit about the assumptions on the model. And um, these are not the weakest assumptions probably one can use. And, um, but I just want some assumptions uh, to ensure that we get a stationary um, solution to that nonlinear AR model. So I don't, I'm not going after the ultimate weakest stuff because um, that's kind of a, uh, uh, a secondary issue. So we'll assume that the noise has a, a probability density function, which is uh, positive everywhere. So that's gonna make it nice so that this, this chain, so from any point, pre, from any uh, xt, <clears throat> you can get to any other value. Um, and that it says, the, the, it has it satisfies this moment condition, called, sometimes called the Bernstein condition, um, that the mth moment is less than m factorial Cm minus two. And we'll assume something else on the CDF of epsilon one. And that, it, this looks a little strange, maybe, um, is that the CDF evaluate X plus tall. Tall is kind of any, any real number divided by um, its distribution evaluated X. You take the soup on X and that this, this is finite for any, any tall. And obviously when X is large, this is not a, a problem because this, this is bounded away from zero. Um, so the, the issue here is really when x is um, when x is small, when the denominator gets near zero. Um, the next condition we assume is that the f this function uh, f in the um, defining equation for this nonlinear AR model is bounded. 
Um, this is uh, kind of a typical assumption that people use in for random forest. And then finally, uh, there's a condition on the on the leaves. So we have this um, this, this lambda is a is a random is a recursive partition or it's a tree, and then at the end you have leaves. <clears throat> That's the last uh, level, the nodes or the leaves. Um, and the number of points in each leaf has to be k. And k, and k is going to satisfy a condition that k over log t, t is the sample size, to the fourth power has to go to infinity. So what this is saying um, is that k has to go to infinity. I have another slide here that kind of explains these conditions. So let me, let me go to that. There's a little delay in this, um, advancing the slides here. I apologize for that. <clears throat> So the first condition was that epsilon one has a, a, a probability density function that's positive that satisfies the Bernstein conditions and then has this funny left tail condition. So the, the main one of the reasons for some of those conditions is that it gives a geometrically ergodic stationary solution to the Markov chain. We could get by with a little less, but um, uh, we need more to do the to do work with the, the random force. The Bernstein condition implies that epsilon one, the distribution is uh, sub exponential. So it has a form that looks like this. Um, the probably e epsilon one is greater than X is less than or equal to E to the minus gamma two X. And this is for gamma two. Um, these are some constants, uh, non negative constants. And this is for all X uh, positive. So we have this kind of sub exponential uh, pro property here. In the left uh, tail condition um, that I mentioned about the, the distribution function, the ratio of the distribution function evaluated x plus tall divided by f evaluated at x, that that has to be uh, bounded for all, you take the soup on x. This is implied if the density function, uh, if you look at the ratio of the density function, this um, exists and is non-zero for all, tall greater than zero. So there, there, there Many um, you know distributions that uh, meet this kind of condition, so something like the um, Laplace or, or or Gaussian. I think even log many log concave distributions also satisfy that as long as the con the distribution is supported on the entire real line. Uh, log concave distributions could have finite support. So um, I don't think this excludes too many. Obviously, we're not talking about heavy tailed. Um, distributions here. So we assume the F, um, the F is, is, is bounded. Uh, um, this is an implicit assumption on virtually all theoretical work. Since um, the starting point for most work on random force is that these X, the, the feature space, that that is actually zero one to the P power. And then they assume that this F is continuous on that. So immediately, um, uh, you, you have that sort of condition. Uh, we're also going to transform back to the 0, 1 to the p, but this is not as easy as it is in a regression problem because the distribution of the y's um, or the x's depend also on y, t. So you have to do that in a kind of clever way. And I think that's one of the clever parts of how we do that transformation to get it back to 0, 1, p. You don't do the integral probability transform on each of the components. That's not the right thing to do. And this condition on the number of points in each leaf, we, we want the number of points increasing uh, with the sample size in order to get some sort of consistency because we're going to average over points in that leaf. There's only a finite number of points and it'll be a little bit stuck. So it has to increase, but log t is not going to infinity very fast. So um, that, I don't think that's a major um, impediment there. Okay, so those those are the comments on the on, on the assumptions, and uh, we're ready for the first uh, first result, which is a concentration um, inequality, and <clears throat> um, so if these three conditions are satisfied, then there exists a, a, a beta such that if you look at the difference between this estimate and this kind of um, optimal partition uh, guy, uh, T star lambda, 
that and you take the soup over all x so you're taking a soup over all x and over all partitions lambda in some group of partitions so we're, really, we're restricting our partitions so that each partition of leaves have at least k points and then so this is a fairly strong result so you're taking a soup over x and over all these partitions and this is less rank called the beta a uh, lot t squared times the square root of k. And this happens with probably at least uh, one over uh, one, one minus one, four over t for all sufficiently large t. And the reason for the square root of k is that really, if you think, think of a, a fixed leaf, and we're not taking a soup over lambda, then this error, since it's an error over uh, k, uh, k points, that error should be roughly one over constant over square root of k. So we have that. And then we're paying a little bit of a price because we're doing a soup over all x and over all lambda. So that it gives us log t squared up there, which is, it seems like it's not a huge price. Um, it's not a huge price to pay. And now there's a, there's a corollary for forest. So this is based on one tree. So we could look at multiple um, trees. So here is W, script W sub K consists of all trees, uh, which are valid. Uh, they Each leaf has at least K points in it. And then we'll choose B trees. <clears throat> so we have lambda one up to lambda B. These are B trees. And instead of um, looking at the our estimate over just one tree that we have here, we'll just average over B trees. So that's the H lambda. And then the H lambda star will be the same thing for the optimal uh, partition forecast. We'll average over these B trees. And the, the, the corollary here, this is, um, you know, B is not going to infinity. It's just that it seems reasonable to take more trees is that you get exactly the same, um, the same, the same bound here. Okay, so this, um, you know, borrows um, heavily from some work by others, uh, mainly in uh, Wegar and, and Walther, a 2015 paper. Um, all the trees we use here are constructed from the same data set, DT. Um, Bryman does it a little differently. What he does is he, he, he does an initial bootstrap of the data and then constructs a tree based on that new data set. So the, the samples differ and the trees are, are different. And the idea here now is that if, if F is smooth and a diameter of each leaf shrinks to zero, then the, uh, you can see my hands, the force estimates uh, should be consistent. So getting to consistency, here's how we construct um, the trees is that um, we'll have some more parameters. Well, if alpha is between 0 0.5 and an M, which is greater than or equal to 2K. So any currently unsplit node with at least M data points will eventually be split. So we don't want to have leaves that have too many points in them. The probability that a given uh, node is split along the i-th direction is bounded from below. So we want these uh, probabilities to be uh, greater than, I mean, th these could depend on the sample size, but we want it to be bounded by some constant, say rho or whatever. And then the split decision, uh, at each child node. So when we do the split of A into two child nodes, we want to make sure that each um, each node uh, contains at least alpha percent of the uh, uh, parent nodes. So um, so we don't want a case where in this in the split um, A L gets like uh, two points and A right gets uh, the rest of them. Then you get some issues with edge effects. So we want to make sure that each have um, at least say 30 percent of, uh, of the points from the parents. So it's, it's not so one-sided. So in order to go, so far we haven't assumed anything about F other than it being bounded. We'll need some smoothest conditions to get, to get consistency and the smoothest conditions will be that um, it's Lipschitz uh, satisfies the Lipschitz condition, and we'll have a growth condition on on M. It's the number of minimum points in a in a leaf, and this alpha, um, this thing could go to zero. It could be uh, could be fixed. 
And so let me just state what the main, the main result is here is that when we do that, then F hat of T, which is, um, it could be based on one tree or it could be based on B trees. Um, this is a pointwise consistent estimator of F. Uh, F hat of T converges to F of um, X in probability. And that if you wanna think about X as being random, then uh, F T hat, um, if you insert X into that, that that converges um, and probability to this um, the conditional expectation. So this is the um, this is the uh, the consistency that we were um, after, and um, let me. I think I'm getting short on time, so let me uh, skip sort of the main ideas and the arguments. I guess the slides will be posted, and maybe this is being recorded, so you can actually um, go through these slides in more detail. But there's there are some tricks and some um, of how you transform the xt. Uh, to zero one to the p, you don't use integral probability transform. There's some concentration inequalities where we needed some of those conditions about the geometric uh, ergodicity um, of the Markov chain, um, and the fact that the leaves get smaller means that um, um, that that's a key part for getting the consistency. So here's I just want to show you what happens uh, in. in uh, practice, I shouldn't say in practice, but in simulation. So here's, I'm just do P equals one. Um, I have four different choices for F. The first is an AR1, um, it's 0.5 times X, but that's if X is lesser than equal to 10. We have a problem because um, F has to be bounded. So when X is greater than 10, then this guy is just equal to 0.5 times 10 is equal to five. So it's truncated AR1. We have an exponential AR2. We have a damped sinusoid. And then we have a spline-like function. And for this simulation, we used like 400 trees, uh, different sample sizes, and K was chosen um, this way. So here's the uh, four realizations from these um, time series. They're truncated at 400 uh, observations, so you can get a sense that they look like nonlinear time series. This is not so useful, actually, these, uh, these plots. Um, What's more useful is plotting yt versus yt minus one because that gives you some idea about what the function should look like. So I'm gonna plot, this is the scatter diagram of, uh, these are the gray points. Hopefully you can see those gray points. In the, so those are, that's yt versus yt minus one on the x-axis. <coughs> the blue line is the truth. And if I remove that blue line, I think you'd have a heck of a time trying to figure out what it should be. I mean, this, these are not obvious, but maybe you're better at that than I am. This one I think is really hard. Um, just remove the blue line if you can, the curve, and then try to think that this is the curve, this is the density function, uh, this is the F that you would estimate. I, I think it's pretty tough going. So let's see how this guy does. The, um, so in the upper left is the AR1, the truncated AR1. And the blue line, I don't know sure if you can see it, is the truth. That's um, f of x is equal to x. And then it, uh, we, in this, in this uh, example, um, the data never got bigger than 10. So this truncation was never enforced. So it's really an, an AR1. The green is with 400. This is um, the random force estimate. It's with uh, 400 um, uh, points in the, in the leaves. And red has, no, I shouldn't say that. It's a sample size 400. And the, um, the red is uh, a bigger sample size, 1600. And T, uh, the brown, I'm not sure you can see, is 6400. So you can see that um, they, get, they get better as you know, the sample size increases. But it's getting a general shape pretty well, I think. Um, again, and then this is for this um, uh, damp sinusoid. The blue is the truth. The green is what you get with 400. Um, it's getting the frequent the frequency right. It's, it's not um, the amplitude isn't quite as large as it should be, but I think it's it's doing pretty well. Um, and, and then you can look at these at these others. Um, this is a case for p is equal to two. Maybe I'll just skip that one. I think there was one more that I wanted to show you. 
Oh, yeah, this one. Um, so this this shows, um, this is a sample size, I can't remember. Um, maybe like 1600 or so. And this shows the impact of increasing K. So K is equal to 40. That means the number of leaves is, uh, the number of points per leaf is only 40. And then um, the red one is you increase the number of points in the leaf. And then um, the brown one is um, six, you have a lot. And so what, what happens is that as you increase the number of points in the leaf, you get rougher curves, you get smoother curves. So the fewer points you have, it's rougher. It's like a variance, variance, you know, classical variance bias trade-off. So the green one with fewer points per leaf is um, is rougher, but um, it's less biased. So that um, you can see that pretty clearly. Okay, so here here are, um, some references. The uh, the ones we used a lot was this Weger. We use a Meinhausen. Uh, of course, the ideas from Bryman. Uh, uh, come into play uh, a lot. So on that note, let me just um, finish with a takeaway message here. It's maybe <laughs> Thank you, Richard. taking longer to load. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So the takeaway message, is, um, lot to, there's a lot more to do and, and please enjoy Lumini. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Um, so uh, we'll turn to maybe questions uh, from uh, the audience uh, online abroad first. So for those who have a question, maybe simply turn on your mic and uh, yeah, ask a question. I have a question over here. Yes, please. Can you listen to me? Yes, um, okay, uh, Richard, thank you for your talk. I was wondering, how do you choose tau in more than one dimension? Tau is like a, I guess is a, it belongs to RP, right? Or it belongs no, to R1? No, it's one dimensional. So when you do, the time you do a split, it's on, it's correspond to one axis. Okay. And you make sure that you circulate through all the axes, so you eventually split. So it, yeah, it's a one dimensional, uh, Okay, I see. I see. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, hi again, Reiner talking here. Richard, um, can you re explain um, what is the specific difficulty to do this in the time series case? Or to put the question differently, do you, did you show new results that hold also for the IID case? Or has this been covered in the literature before? And well, the ID case, okay, uh, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, uh, no, 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 that's the question. <laughs> in the ID case, this has been done. Um, uh, the the Wager Walter um, yeah. paper does that. It's the theory is not developed so well, actually. So consistency mm -hmm. is a fairly recent thing. It's in the last you know five years or so in the ID case. Um, Sometimes you might be able to get normality, but there's a kind of a bias thing that it's you have to really understand the error of that of that bias to show that it's negligible. But it's 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 amazing that people use this stuff, but the theory is um, way behind. Mm -hmm. But it works in practice, so I, people are happy with it. And yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and if you believe in bootstrap and stuff, then you can get you know confidence regions or whatever. But I think. Um, there's a lot to be done. The, the time series complications are that the, that when you do this um, partitioning, you're doing it with dependent data, mm -hmm. as opposed with independent ones. So there's some there's some tricks there. It's not just. Um, but is it more like theoretical tricks, or can you easily come up with a time series where this would stop to, to work because too much correlation or whatever? Um. I mean, that's a good question because we're using like uh, um, Bernstein type um, inequalities and stuff. Right. So, so, you know, maybe it could work without using that if you were more clever. No, 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 no. But it's really te technical. It's not that intrinsically I mean, there is a limit that you say, okay, long memory or something, then it's going to yeah, fail. I have my doubts. You know, you'd get different types of results. I sure. think you get consistency, but. 
Yeah. So, well, I'm sure you're saying, but this is all he can do. <laughs> no, 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 not at all. On the contrary. Good <laughs> job. Thank you very much. Like really good or whatever, but I'm sorry. I, I didn't deliver uh, more than I, I can't deliver more yet. Okay, maybe uh, there are some questions uh, in uh, the audience here in Marseille. Ah, yes, uh, Jean-Marc. Richard, uh, is there a way for choosing uh, K uh, in function of, uh, of uh, T, for instance, using cross-validation? I, I do not know. Something that uh, allow you to, to, to have a good K. Yeah, I, I would guess that some cross-validation ideas work there. I mean, they certainly would work in practice. How do you prove this stuff? I'm not so sure. In an ID case, it may be easier, but I'm not sure about, you know, in this in this dependent in this dependent case. Um, you know, it, you know, Brian and those guys, you really think about having a training sample and then you have a you know test set, and then um, that's how they measure how well they're doing and stuff. Um, tuning up the the force on the training set and then applying it to the to the uh, test set we don't so this problem is we don't really do that here i mean conceptually you might think about how we might do that but i'm not sure okay thank you there is a question uh from Rom remy garnier uh, thank you for the presentation um i was wondering the good thing with uh random forest model is that they can handle well a, a lot of uh, uh, large varieties of uh, different data and if you can see in in time series it's it, it means generally uh, external data so does your does your work uh, can can your work be extended to uh, external data or 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 is it uh, well there's been some recent work done in that situation where you have i'm not sure if this is going to answer your question but where you, it's a kind of a regression model that I, I started with in the ID case, but the epsilon t's are time series. And so they're really interested in estimating that f um, and sort of compensating for the fact that you don't have ID noise, but you have a time series noise. It's like doing regression, sort of standard linear regression with time series errors. And how can you adapt that, you know, the random forest to take into account um, this dependence, but I think what they do is they just apply random force, um, as in the ID case, and just say, "Here's here's some of the um, here's some of the adjustments you make." I'm not sure they actually can improve those estimates, taking advantage of the dependence in the um, time series um, errors. But the the put, but I haven't seen anyone put the full package together where you do both this external variables and the, and the time series, which is what I think you were asking. About that. Yeah. Okay. Um, maybe I have I have a last question. Um, so you you mentioned the fact that uh, random forests work well uh, in a high dimension, um, but uh, so in your bounds, it does not seem that uh, the dimension was uh, uh, a problem. I mean, uh, or was it uh, hidden somewhere? Uh, p the the parameter p seems to to not appear. Well, there are. There are bounds that one uses in the course of these proofs that depend um, on P. So like the beta would depend on P and some other things that um, go away, that go away when you think of P as being fixed and it's not increasing with uh, time. So if you keep track of that, it's a, little, it's a lot more complicated. Also, the conditions aren't so clear to me, especially on F, that it's bounded and that you allow this the dimensions to increase and then how you do this transformation back to um, zero one to the P that it's easier when you have independent uh, covariates, so to speak, than when you have YTs because the, the nature of the model is forcing the distribution on the Ys. And so if you try and do this transformation on the previous Ys uh, as a function of P, we, we've done it, but it's not very, it's not pleasant, you know? So uh, we try to do the clean, Kind of a clean version here. Okay, so let's thanks uh, Richard.